what is going on with the Green Bay Packers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and getting the Seattle Seahawks win the NFC West. All that and more on today's episode of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On NFL Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Monday. That means you have me, Kevin Ostriker, the host over at Locked On Ravens. And thank you so much for tuning in today, making us your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms. That includes over on YouTube in video form. And today's episode of Locked On NFL is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players. And if they score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win 10 times the money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's pricepicks.com. Promo code locked on. And we are back here following week seven's Sunday action. A really interesting slate of games, I would say, and some upsets. We had upsets galore, honestly, across the entire league. And we'll be talking with both Peter Bukowski of Locked On Packers and James Yarko of Locked On Buccaneers about just what's going on with those two teams, two teams with really high expectations. Both, though, aren't living up to those expectations. Both suffer pretty bad losses in Week 7, the Packers to the Commanders. And then the Buccaneers, they fall to the Panthers. And so we'll talk with both those guys. And then in the final segment, we'll be talking with Corbin Smith of Locked on Seahawks about if the Seattle Seahawks can win the NFC West. And if Geno Smith is an MVP candidate, so be sure to stay tuned for that one. But we're taking you around our network here. The biggest stories from our local experts. So let's now start off with Peter Bukowski of Locked on Packers talking about what is going on right now in Green Bay. Well, the Green Bay Packers now on a three-game losing streak after falling in Week 7 to the Washington Commanders. Here to talk about what's going on in Green Bay right now is Peter Bukowski, the host over at Locked on Packers. And Peter, I know that many people had pretty high expectations for this team coming into the year. The defense, obviously Aaron Rodgers coming back, that 1-2 tandem Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. But things just seem to be awry in Green Bay right now. Let's start off with this Commanders game. They lose. I think that you just look at it and you're thinking, well, the Packers are pretty favored in this one. And then they go out and they lose it 23 to 21. What happened that had them lose this game? (sighs) How much time? How long is this show again, Kevin? (laughs) Um, No, the interesting thing is at one point in this game, and it's easy to forget now that the Packers were up 14 to three. Taylor Heineke looked fully deer in headlights and every throw he made was contested. Russell Douglas in the first like 20 minutes of game action had almost three interceptions. Now he did not have, he ended up with zero interceptions, but he almost had three. Um, They did have the pick six. The Packers did with Devondre Campbell. And it just looked like this Washington team was not up to the task. And then uh, the offense for the Packers went into hibernation mode. They were not running the ball, even though Washington played a ton of too high coverage. They did nothing creatively creatively on offense, despite the fact that Washington played pretty basic stuff. Um, Only a handful of snaps of man coverage, um, as Aaron Rodgers said after the game. This was a pretty basic game plan because they thought they could rush for drop seven and just eat up everything that the Packers were going to do. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. Um, There was another play, though, where the Packers, Rashawn Gary comes from behind, Taylor Heineke is scrambling, Rashawn Gary comes from behind, plants Taylor Heineke it is a 60 yard scoop and score and it looks like the Packers are just out the gate like this is just going to be a game where the wheels fall off for the commanders and they go home and and the Packers get to go home feeling really good about themselves the opposite happened um a a very shaky very shaky Kevin illegal contact penalty was thrown um it was Contact six yards past the line of scrimmage versus five. It was very incidental contact. It was a bad penalty. But the Packers didn't respond well. And then in the second half, um, they they turned the ball over. They, they um, muff a punt. It was just these little things, these constant penalties. It's it's a conglomeration of little things right now, Kevin, where you if you just like pick each little thing out. Oh, that's a weird thing. Oh, that's a weird thing. That's a weird thing. But... Now they have like 15 weird things happen. 
And now you're losing to a team that, like you said, they were favored by four and a half on the road in Washington. Um, and, and they're a mess right now. Right. And people had high expectations for that offense. And no, Peter, we've talked about the wide receiver position. Did they do enough to me to do more, but you have Aaron Rodgers there, you know, the reigning MVP who you think, Hey, this is somebody who should be able to drag this offense, even if the skill position players are a little bit less than what you might want. You do have Aaron Jones, you do have AJ Dillon, but this team has not scored over 30 points once so far this season. Mm -hmm. And in this game, it just felt like the offense was a bit stagnant. You got Aaron Jones who had a phenomenal game, but it, are you blaming a lot of this on Aaron Rodgers? Is some Aaron Rodgers more on the wide receivers and just the lack of talent they have? Where are you putting the blame on offense right now? There's plenty to go around. I know that um, there there is blame that falls on everyone's shoulders. It's it's the coaching, it's the quarterback, it's the receivers. Um, the the one difference in this game is you can't blame the blocking. You can't blame the pass protection against Montez Sweat, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, a really good Washington front. The Packers allowed one QB hit and no sacks. Aaron Rodgers was protected for most of this game. So, and that was with a brand new offensive line group. The Packers did a bunch of reshuffling. David Bakhtiari out. They put the rookie, Zach Tom, fourth round pick at tackle. He played very well. They put Elton Jenkins from right tackle back to left guard where he had been, you know, an all pro caliber player, but they were trying him at tackle to see if he could, he could hack it out there coming off the ACL right now. He can't. And they move Yash Nyman, who was the backup swing tackle who had been playing and rotating in with David Bakhtiari, who played last year at right tackle moving John Ornian Jr. over to right guard. Did you did you catch all of that, Kevin? There will be a test later. Um, and that, that means on your offensive line, the only person playing the same position that they played last week is the center, Josh Myers. The, that's the only thing that stayed the same. And they held up. Now they held up against a defense that did not blitz very much. But still, you cannot put the blame on the shoulders of the offensive line. So then where do you, where do you put the blame? Well... The receivers, it, you know, drops are, are tough, but probably a half a dozen, at least at least four or five for sure. Um, three of them came on third down, including an Alan Lazard one on the very first drive where it's third and four slant. This is your money play. He's he's open balls on target. Just just a straight drop. But then late in the game, third and two to Romeo Dobbs at his feet when it, the ball could have been right in his hands. Um, there was a, a, another play where you have an opportunity to get it's third and 10, you get nine and a half. And then you go on fourth down and the call on fourth down is a screen to the left, a receiver screen. Why? It's a four man front. You have AJ Dillon in the backfield, who's 250 pounds of muscle. And that's the call. And then what happens? So it's a bad call one, that's coaching. Number two, Rodgers gets the ball to Romeo Dobbs, who is the receiver on the play. Sammy Watkins doesn't block anybody. If Sammy Watkins blocks half a man, it's a, it's a first down. Now, Romeo Dobbs sort of bobbles the ball because he's trying to see what's happening upfield. But one of the reasons why he's trying to see what's happening upfield is because you have a corner screaming off the end because Sammy Watkins didn't block him. You brought in Sammy Watkins to be a veteran who you don't have to worry about being in the right spot at the right time who you could trust to block, who you could trust to not be moving when the tight end is in motion. The Packers had an illegal shift call because Sammy Watkins didn't realize he needed to be on the line of scrimmage. Alan Lazard had to tell him, well, in the middle of that, Robert Tunney is coming across the formation. They didn't get set. It's a penalty. It's that kind of stuff that is just, it, it's plaguing this team right now. So it's everything, Kevin. The answer is it's everything. The problem for Aaron Rodgers is he hasn't played well enough. And, and, you know, this is a tough day for me to say that because of all the drops. But the, he missed a couple throws down the field by 15, 20 yards. And when it mattered, Taylor Heineke, yeah, he was throwing to Terry McLaurin, but he was throwing to Terry McLaurin into tight coverage to Jair Alexander, and he put the ball in the bucket on a touchdown throw, the go-ahead touchdown throw. And then with the game on the line, you have Kenny Clark gets free. If the Packers can force an incompletion, the commanders decided to throw on third and long with two minutes left and the Packers had no timeouts. They decided to throw and they get it because Taylor Heineke stood in there and made an incredible throw to the sidelines with Kenny Clark about to absolutely light him up. 
And it's one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside with Jair Alexander. And they complete it. Those, I understand he's throwing to Terry McLaurin. Those are big boy, like superstar plays from Taylor Heineke, even though he's not a superstar. He's an NFL player. And every NFL player is capable of superstar plays at one or two times in a game, right? He made them. Aaron Rodgers is making $50 million a year. He is the two-time reigning league MVP, a four-time MVP in his career. He is supposed to be the best player on this team and is supposed to be one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback in football. He is the one who should have been making those plays, and it's Taylor Heineke instead. That is emblematic of where this team is right now. Their best players, the things they could count on last year, the play calling, the quarterback play, the offensive line play, the superstar defensive players like Devondre Campbell, who did show up in this game, by and large, they have not been able to rely on those things this season. And, and that is why they, they just, they look a mess right now. And based off of that answer, Peter, I have a two part question for you. One, do you still think the Packers are contenders this season? And two, if you don't think they are, even if you do, how, how do you fix this? Is this just, you got to ride it out internally? Do you make a trade, make a couple signings? Where are you with that? So they play in the NFC. So like until, until they have what 11 losses, I don't think they can be ruled out of the NFC just because the NFC is so soft this season. Um, here, here's my list of teams that I'm, I'm, I'm sure are good in the NFC Philadelphia. That's the list, like a pretty uninspiring win against the, the lions on Sunday for the Cowboys. Although I think the Cowboys are pretty clearly the second best team. I think, I think they're the other, the other quote unquote, good team in the NFC. And I think the 49ers when they're healthy can get there. Um, them getting boat raced by the chiefs, notwithstanding. I mean, given the circumstances, um, the chiefs and the bills are just everyone else. They're, it's just they are in they are at a tier that I don't think anyone else right now can can match. I think the Bengals have a chance to get there. They looked awesome on Sunday. That offense is as as explosive as it gets. And then like I don't know why why can't the Seahawks be good? But the, we've we've gone a little bit far afield here. Yeah, the Packers can still be contenders in the NFC because the NFC stinks. But can they can they even like they're eleven and a half point underdogs to the Bills on Sunday? They are not in that realm. So like serious contenders? No, 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 no. They are a long way from that. And I don't, I don't, they could trade for, you know, Devontae Adams back and they wouldn't be that given the way that they've played so far this season. But that's, that's the thing. And, and yes, I think this is fixable. So that's, that's the second part of this is I think this is fixable and that they can be a team that, that wins a playoff game or two in the postseason because it's their best players. It's Aaron Rodgers. It's Matt LaFleur. It's an offensive line that looks pretty good now. It's getting Aaron Jones more touches. The Packers have been saying for a month they need to run the ball more and get Aaron Jones more involved in the offense. <laughs> yeah. Season low in rushing on Sunday against Washington. Like that is, seems like an easy fix. Just give him more opportunities because every time they do, he makes plays. Um, and, and so I think, I think some of this stuff will get ironed out. I think the defense, if it gets any help from the offense in the second halves of these games, it will play much better in the second half. I and mean, we saw what the attrition can do in Panthers Buccaneers, it, it, the, the offense could do nothing for Tampa in the second half. And so Carolina breaks off big chunk runs at the end of the game when the defense is gassed, that's happening a little bit, I think in green Bay. And so get a little bit more continuity offensively get these receivers a little bit more up to speed and the mental mistakes. Aaron Rodgers talks about it after the game. It's all mental mistakes and mistakes that weren't being made last year. Um, and so I think that that part of it is fixable. There's some, there's some stuff going on in green Bay that, that I don't know if that's fixable. I think there's, there's some ideological tension, even if it's not actual tension between what Aaron Rodgers wants to be and what Matt LaFleur wants to be. And I think, unless Matt LaFleur starts to win those battles a little bit more, it's going to be a lot harder to hide the deficiencies that this skill group has. Now you trade for a guy like Brandon cooks. If that is something that can actually happen or a guy like chase Claypool, I think that can change the way your offense looks in a hurry, but they, they don't like, I watch the chiefs going, the, the chiefs and the Packers don't play the same sport right now offensively. And so can they get to that level? No, not this year.
not this year. And that tough test against Buffalo coming up on Sunday night for the Packers. So I don't know what that line would around, have to be but... for you to make me go. I would take the <laughs> Packers in that. I really don't like. I think you'd have to make it like seventeen. Like I think the Packers can win. Can win. I think they can keep it close if they play their best game. But for me to put put my hard earned money on it, yeah, man, it's got to be over two touchdowns for me to want to to want to put my money on that. And that and that's a that's a sad state of affairs. Aaron Rodgers never been more than an eight and a half point underdog in a game in his NFL career double digit underdogs in the middle of a season. Unbelievable. Well, yeah, Packers on the three game losing streak. The Bills coming off a bye and they've been red hot this year, obviously. So we'll see how that game turns out. Maybe the Packers can pull off that underdog win and turn it around, but we shall see. Peter, I appreciate you hopping on for more on this Packers team and how they can fix their woes. Be sure to tune in to Peter on the Locked On Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Peter, thanks so much. We're going to see if Green Bay can turn it around. Hopefully they do. They do have the reigning MVP there in Aaron Rodgers. So I'd say they have at least a chance to do so. But coming up, we're going to be diving in to our conversation with James Jarko of Locked On Buccaneers about Tom Brady and whether he can turn the Tampa Bay Buccaneers around following their disappointing start. So be sure to stay tuned. We still have a ton to talk about here on Locked On NFL. But first, this episode is brought to you by Prediction Strike, the world's first sports stock market. You can now invest in professional athletes just like stocks. It's a lower risk alternative to sports betting and athlete prices move based on performance and supply and demand. And so if you invested in, let's say, Jalen Hurts one year ago, it'd be up 48.2%. You have guys like Rashad Penny being up. Kyle Pitts is actually down, not struggling to start the season. And there are tons of other options for you to look at and all athletes benefit too and are entitled to a percentage of their market cap and you have 2.5 percent trade fees which is the lowest real money in sports and you can invest in four sports not just the nfl but you have ufc nba and mlb so all the prediction strike app and use code locked for a free share when you sign up and make a first deposit of 20 dollars and more that's promo code locked for a special one-time giveaway prediction strike will choose one person who signs up with code locked to make a deposit to win 100 for random shares that could be worth up to three thousand dollars if you get lucky and receive josh allen shares invest in what you know on prediction strike the stock market for sports and I want to tell you a bit about Blue Nile and whether you're looking to pop the question, have a milestone to celebrate, or want to let your love sparkle, Blue Nile can help you make your celebrations even more memorable with so many people using and trusting Blue Nile. And as an original online jeweler, Blue Nile offers the largest selection of independently graded diamonds and pieces priced significantly below traditional retailers. Blue Nile has helped millions of couples create their perfect engagement ring. They're easy online tools that you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then help you handcraft a perfect one of a diamond engagement ring. And if you're looking for a piece of fine jewelry to commemorate a special milestone, but if you're having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7. They're available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget and shop stress free of Blue Nile's 100% satisfaction guarantee. All Blue Nile orders are insured and shipped for free in discreet packaging. They also offer overnight shipping if you're in a rush. So make your moment sparkle with Blue Nile. Go to BlueNile.com and use code LOCKDOWN to save $50 on your purchase of $500 or more. That's B L U E N I L E.com. Code LOCKDOWN to save $50 on your purchase of $500 or more. BlueNile.com. Code LOCKDOWN. We're back here. Our second segment of Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostriker, your host, still here with you. Thank you so much for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, follow along in audio format. Now we're going to be diving into our conversation with James Jarko of Locked On Buccaneers about just what's going on with Tom Brady and those Buccaneers down in Tampa Bay. So we'll dive into it now. Well, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had high expectations coming into the season, but after their latest loss to the Carolina Panthers, some are beginning to rethink those expectations and here to talk about just what's going on in Tampa Bay right now is one of the hosts of Locked On Buccaneers, James Yarko. And James, this week in particular, week seven, this was a game where Tampa was highly favored to win. Carolina just traded away Christian McCaffrey, obviously entering that rebuild phase. And Tampa loses 21 to three, just pretty much domination by the Panthers. What happened in this game to have Tampa drop it? I mean, you you don't need to look any further than the opening drive for the Buccaneers, right? Mike Evans, wide open for a walk-in 65-yard touchdown, and he bobbles it and drops it. And that was just kind of uh, the perfect analogy for what's going on with this offense right now. And, and you almost have to wonder, if he makes that catch and he walks in, how different 
is this game. The, the Panthers are immediately dejected. The Buccaneers offense finally gets off to a hot start, and, and maybe the course of events is more like what we saw the last four meetings between the Bucs and the Panthers. But instead, you're left shaking your head because it's the same story week in and week out. Luckily, the defense was able to bail out the offense early in the year, but it's the same vanilla play calling. It, there's no creativity. It's very predictable. And you just kind of have to wonder now, what is the underlying issue that is causing this Buccaneers offense to stutter and to stagnate? Is it no Bruce Arians on the sideline? Is it no faith in an offensive line that has drastically changed from last year? Is I don't think it's father time. Tom Brady still has the arm that he has always had, but there are some serious issues here, and the Bucs have a very short week to try to figure out some answers. Right, and you mentioned Tom Brady. I do want to get your thoughts on how he's performed this season. I know with him being the quarterback and with him being the player that he has been over the course of his career, a lot of blame will fall onto Brady. But do you think this is almost some on Tom Brady? Is it all on Tom Brady or not at all? Is it not on Tom Brady? And you mentioned just some of the other pieces around him not stepping up. Oh, I have absolutely received some criticism for my criticism of Tom Brady. I've had people to tell me to stop blaming it on Brady, but Brady is part of the problem. There's a lot of parts of the problem. Brady happens to be one of them, and just because he's the greatest to ever do it doesn't mean that he's immune to criticism. He has left passes short to open receivers. He's missed throws. He's He doesn't look like himself, even – when he's speaking with the media, even in some of these candid situations, he's been a lot of fun the last couple of years on Twitter and, and doing some of these, you know, videos and, and, and fun stuff with the Buccaneers organization. That's not there. He doesn't look happy. He doesn't look like he's enjoying having come back for, for this season. And you start to look at the play of the offensive line. And I think a lot of the blame, Starts starts up front. You don't have Ryan Jensen. Ali Marpet retired against the Panthers. They had a guard by committee situation where you were you were playing Luke Gedicky. You pull him for Nick Leverett. Then you put Gedicky back in the game. Then you pull him again for Leverett. You're not going to win any games when you do guard by committee in the NFL. So Tom Brady not having that protection up front that he's had to sit back in that pocket for three, four, five seconds and hit these deep passes to Godwin or Evans or Scotty Miller or, or whoever, that internal clock is starting to speed up a little bit and it's forcing some bad throws. It's forcing some you know timing routes to be thrown off. It, it's become a complete mess. So yeah, Brady is partially at fault. But as far as the fault pie lies, he's got a pretty small slice. Right. And moving over to the other side of the ball, James, on defense, obviously with the offense that Tampa has, giving up 21 points to the Panthers or 20 points to the Steelers, you expect Tampa to outscore those teams and win, even if it is in the low 20s. But how do you think the defense has played? Obviously, the Chiefs game, they gave up a lot of points there. But overall, the point totals have been relatively low, especially considering, again, the offense that they have. They should have been, at least most people thought, it would outscore these teams and pick up wins. Yeah, no doubt about it. They they hold the Packers to 14 points, and, and the defense has played relatively well, but they're not getting the takeaways that we saw early in the year when they beat the Cowboys, when they beat the Saints, you know, even when they beat the Falcons. The defense was opportunistic in taking the ball away. We are not seeing that right now, and you now have a depleted secondary. Carlton Davis and Sean Murphy Bunting were both inactive for this game. Logan Ryan just had foot surgery. And now Antoine Winfield Jr. leaves against the Carolina Panthers with a concussion. He's probably not going to play on Thursday. So the issues that they were having as far as injuries in the wide receiving core early on in, in training camp and early in the season with Evans and Godwin and Julio and Brashad Perryman and Russell Gage, now all of that has shifted over to the secondary, but the defense is being put in a lot of really bad situations. They kept the Buccaneers in this game for a very long time. The offense was the one that wasn't capitalizing, wasn't sustaining drives, and sending that defense right back out on the field. So by the end of the game, you see Deontay Foreman run off a 60-yard rush because the defense was gassed. They had been out there for so much and not getting anything in return that eventually the levy is going to break and the defense is going to start giving up points. It's exactly what we saw against Carolina.
And you mentioned injuries, and every team goes through injuries, but you no can't doubt. deny the impact that injuries do have on a football team, especially with some of the teams we saw last year and two years ago. How much of in injuries impacted both the offense and the defense? You alluded to the wide receivers, talked about the secondary, but how much of an impact have they had? It's massive, and you don't need to look any further than Ryan Jensen. Ryan, losing him on the second day of training camp for we still don't know how long – has negatively impacted this team, especially on the offensive side of the ball, both on the field and off the field. Ryan Jensen is a leader in that locker room. Players look to him for guidance. They look to him for leadership, and he brings that. There are not very many centers, if any, in the National Football League that are like Ryan Jensen. So when he's on the field, he has a major impact in both the running game and in pass protection. You also, you know, you take a look at the issues that they had at left guard. You've been starting Luke Gedeke, but that's because Aaron Stinney went down with a season-ending injury in preseason. He was probably going to be the starter. He started in the Super Bowl for the Bucs two years ago and played really, really well. So you lose two starting offensive linemen. You, as you know, we've talked about, you lose wide receivers. You're losing players in the secondary. You don't have Akeem Hicks, the player you went out and signed to replace Indomitian Sue. And as a result, you're seeing this run defense struggle a lot. You know, they gave up another 170 rushing yards to the Carolina Panthers, 60 of it in one run. You take that away, they still gave up over 100. This was the number one run defense just a few years ago. They were number three last year. That is not Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense and injuries are plaguing this team. You just have to hope that they get healthy and start to turn things around. Right. And the players on the field obviously make this all go, but also a big part of it's the coaching. And I wanted to ask you, James, about if you think the coaching has anything to do with this, obviously Todd Bowles taking over for Bruce Arians here. How much of this has to do with the coaching and maybe just not having this team prepared? Or do you think it's more on the players? Uh, I think a lot of the blame could be placed on coaching, and I like Todd Bowles. I was excited for his opportunity to be the head coach, but he's not Bruce Arians. He's a player's coach, very calm, relaxed demeanor. You know, you you don't know if he just won the lottery or if his dog just died because his face never changes. You take a look at Byron Leftwich and the offensive play calling. Even Jonathan Vilma pointed it out on the broadcast. They're running out of obvious running formations. They're passing out of obvious passing formations. The Carolina Panthers were the worst ranked defense in the NFL. They were 28th in scoring defense and you couldn't find your way into the end zone. Why? Because the players knew exactly what was coming every single play. Something has to change. They have to get more creative. They have to get Rashad White and Cade Otten more involved. Both of them starting to emerge as, as rookie contributors to this offense. You can't continue to run Leonard Fournette behind a offensive line that doesn't get any push when you need short yardage. Trust Mike Evans, trust Chris Godwin, trust Russell Gage to make a catch and gain you a couple yards. There's absolutely no creativity. And the biggest difference that you can point to between last year and this year outside of the offensive line is the guys roaming the sidelines. There is no Bruce Arians. There is no risk it biscuit. Instead, there's just no biscuit. Right, and Tampa has a big Week 8 matchup with the Ravens coming up on Thursday night. So, James, looking forward to just the rest of the season, is this something that you think can be fixed? Do you think Tampa should just ride it out with the guys they have? Do you think they should make a trade? Where is your outlook on the future for this team moving forward in this season? I think it has to be fixed internally. Nobody is walking through that door and saving this team. Odell Beckham Jr. would not walk in and save this team. Rob Gronkowski does not walk in and save this team. Not a lot of teams are looking to trade a starting left guard. So you have to figure it out with the guys you have. Once Ryan Jensen returns, you, you immediately upgrade that offensive line. And I would like to believe that once Jensen is back, Robert Hainsey will then slide over to that guard spot where Luke Gedeke or Nick Leverett have been playing because that's where he played at Notre Dame. And all of a sudden, your entire offensive line gets better. Brady has more time running lanes open, and this offense starts to look a little more reminiscent of what they were in 2020 and 2021. But I don't think there's an easy fix for this team. There's going to be a lot of soul-searching, reflection, and trying to figure out how they are going to win with the guys they already have on the team. 
Well, Tampa will be suiting up against Baltimore in Week 8 Thursday Night Football in prime time. So we'll see him again very soon. And for more on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, be sure to check out James's work alongside David Harrison on the Locked On Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day, James. Thanks so much for hopping on. Quick turnaround for Tampa Bay on Thursday, playing the Ravens, and we will see if they can turn it around then. And look, with Tom Brady, you always have a shot, but people have been saying, and I know James said it wasn't father time, but some people are saying, is it father time with Tom Brady? So we'll see. We'll see if Tom Brady can help will his Tampa Bay Buccaneers to a win in week eight. But in our final segment, we'll be diving into a conversation with Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks about if Seattle can win the NFC West. But first, I do want to tell you a bit about prize picks and i love fantasy i have plenty of shares and plenty of players across many different leagues but if you want a different spin on fantasy be sure to look at prize picks and there are so many things to love about it they have many different games and formats you can use you can have tons of current entries and you can win a lot of money you pick two to five players and if they go score more or less in their prize picks rejection you can up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus projections available. Price picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That includes the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, you have NHL, PGA, college football, college basketball, and more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. They have safe and fast withdrawals and are currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So download the Price picks app and go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, price space will give you $100. If you deposit $50, price space will give you $50. Don't forget the promo code locked on to sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. We're back here, our final segment of Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostriker, your host, still here with you again. Thank you so much for tuning in and making Locked On NFL your first listen of the day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. We're now going to be diving into our final conversation. We're talking with Corbett Smith of Locked On Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks leaving the NFC West right now at 4-3 and three after a Big win against the Los Angeles Chargers. And we'll talk with Corbin about if they can continue that lead, win the NFC West of their contenders, and if Geno Smith is an MVP candidate. So we'll talk about that now. Well, joining me here to talk about the NFC West leading Seattle Seahawks is Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks. And Corbin, I don't know if you were expecting this from the Seattle team, but you have Geno Smith absolutely balling right now. This team beating the Chargers in pretty dominant fashion in Week 7. Let's start with that game. How did Seattle do this? Because really, this was a convincing win for now a team that leads the NFC West. Well, you'll look at the scoreboard and think that this is all about the offense, and certainly they deserve credit scoring 37 points. But the resurgence of this defense the last two weeks, they were left for dead after giving up 45 points to the Lions and 39 points to the Saints in back-to-back games. And yet here we are. Last week, they gave up three points to the Cardinals offensively, and then this week to hold the Chargers to really 21 points. Two of those points were on a safety with Ken Walker the third getting brought down in the end zone, and one of those touchdowns came on short field thanks to a turnover by the Seahawks' offense. I mean, they are playing lights out. I think the real difference in this game was the situational defense from the Seahawks. The Chargers went 5-for-15 on third down. They were 1-for-3 on fourth down, so they weren't moving the chains. They were able to get after Justin Herbert with three sacks. He had been sacked seven times the entire season. He's a difficult guy to bring down. Teams have been getting pressure on him, but they haven't been getting sacks. The Seahawks did. They found ways to get home and bring him down. They limited the running game to under three and a half yards per carry and just 53 yards in the game. That was a huge problem for them two weeks ago. And now suddenly this run defense is coming together. The young players are playing better. They got to stop the end of the first half. And then beginning of the second half, they had five straight punts that they forced in the second half. Like I said, it's all situational football. And that's something they were really struggling with a couple weeks ago. And that things have really turned around. And this was a great offense that was at full strength getting Keenan Allen back in this football game. And Corey Lindsley was back as well. And the Seahawks were able to turn in another really dominant performance. So I think this is more about the defense even than it is the offense. But the offense certainly played well as well in their own right. Right. And let's talk about that offense. Let's talk about Geno Smith. It has been his story has been incredible this season. He was in that quarterback competition with Drew Locke in the preseason. Pete Carroll obviously giving the nod to Geno Smith and the veteran. And I think people expected different things from Geno Smith, but we have seen an absolute tear from him. How impressed have you been with this performance this season? This is a true ascendance. And I'm going to go this far. 
Kevin. I think he right now is a top three candidate to win NFL MVP. I, I don't think that that is a bold take. You look at the numbers. He's first in the NFL in completion rate, 73.5% now, seven games in the season. He is in the top six in touchdowns. He's tied with Aaron Rodgers right now for touchdown passes. He's thrown just three interceptions. His passer rating is third in the NFL behind only Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, who I think are the other two quarterbacks that are MVP candidates. I would lump him in that equation because you look at the expectations this guy was, you know, a lot of people thought he was going to lose to Drew Locke in the quarterback competition. And then after that, it was, well, he's going to start a few games struggle and then it'll be Drew Locke's time. And then, well, he's had a few good games, but he'll go back to earth. The sample size now is seven games and he is not cooling off. The dude is still completing 75% of his passes pretty much every single game. He is in full command of this offense. He's using his legs when he needs to and coming up with big plays. And I think maybe the most important thing, this team is following his lead. They are fully confident in him, and he has stepped into Russell Wilson's stead with full command, and he's got full respect to the coaching staff and the players. The young guys are all gravitating to him. That is the perfect recipe to be a surprise, and that's where the Seahawks have been to this point. So I don't think he would win it if you voted for MVP right now, but he absolutely belongs to the table in my opinion. The, the resurgence has been incredible for Geno Smith. And one of his weapons in this game, DK Metcalf, ended up being carted off of the field. He didn't seem too concerned on the card. Do you have any updates whatsoever regarding Metcalf's injury and whether he'll be okay or if it's more of a serious thing? Well, unfortunately, I can't give you too much on that other than Pete Carroll said that his x-rays were negative. So we know that it's not a bone-related injury. He didn't break anything. But the issue is if you watch the play that it looks like he was injured on, Geno Smith was trying to connect with him for a touchdown in the end zone, and he came down kind of funny on his left leg. And seeing the knee injuries that happened today, J.C. Jackson's was just so rough to watch. But seeing that way he landed on that turf is not encouraging. So they got to see what the MRI looks like. And obviously Pete Carroll couldn't update that, uh, us on that. So I would anticipate that that's going to happen tomorrow. He's going to have those scans, and then the Seahawks will have a better idea where they stand right now. He certainly didn't seem discouraged by it. I thought he was getting carted off for another bathroom break because he was smiling. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the news was not that positive this time around. It was a it was a crappier situation for the Seahawks this time around. So now they're just hoping that he's going to be able to return quickly, maybe not miss any time. We won't know that, though, until we have the MRI results. Right, and so, yeah, obviously wishing a speedy recovery to DK Metcalf. But, Corbin, if he is forced to miss any time, whether it is maybe just a couple weeks or even worst-case scenario of the season, who would step up in his stead? And what did you see in this game in particular from some of those replacements? Well, Marquise Goodwin had his best game since 2018. And even at 31 years old, he can still fly. Had two touchdown catches today. D. Eskridge has been so inconsistent, but there's talent there. There's no question that the kid can be a really good NFL receiver. He just hasn't been able to put it together in his second season. So that would be something that they would really hope for to happen in the second half. If somehow they missed Metcalf for an extended time, can you get some more consistency, more production out of D. Eskridge? And their seventh round pick, Dariq Young, played some today on offense as well. Player they really like. He's a former Division II player, so he's still trying to adjust the NFL, but he's got great size, great athletic tools, so they're excited about his potential. Penny Hart will hopefully be back in the next week or two from a hamstring injury, so they have some pieces. If it is a significant injury, that might change Seattle's viewpoint of the trade deadline, though. I could maybe see them calling the Texans about Brandon Cooks or somebody like that that they otherwise wouldn't be calling about to trade for if Metcalf is indeed lost for several weeks or at worst case scenario this season. I could see John Schneider working the phones because Seattle is very much right now in the playoff hunt, leading the NFC West after seven weeks. Right, and, and let's go to the trade deadline. If Metcalf, if they have to go wide receiver, you mentioned Brandon Cooks, are there any other names you would look at? And if it's not wide receiver, is there another position you could potentially see Seattle trading for? I think if they were going to be swinging for the fences at the trade deadline, I think they would be looking at a guy like Cooks that is a proven veteran that still has the speed to take the top off of a defense. Maybe they could reach around, you know, look for some flyers on some bigger body receivers, but you're not going to find another DK Metcalf out there available to trade for. Like, uh, so they'd have to look at some different style receivers, I think. And, you know, they could also maybe look – at the waiver wire, see if there's anybody out there. They have some guys in their practice squad that they like, but that's a huge drop-off. So 
I'm not sure exactly who they'd be calling about. I don't think they'd call the Jets about Elijah Moore, but that would be an interesting thing to consider because they have a working history with the Jets. and They've made a number of trades, including the Jamal Adams one. So there's some names out there, but uh, with so many teams muddied in the middle with three and four and four and three records, I don't know how many teams are going to be selling players at this point. I think Brandon Cooks would be one, though, that would make sense for both teams if Seattle needs to go that route. Hopefully Metcalf is not going to miss much time and it's not a serious injury. Right. I know it seems like Cooks might be on his way out of Houston. So maybe Seattle is a likely trade partner there in the event that Metcalf has to miss some time. But Corbin, I want to give you a two part question here. And you mentioned that Seattle, you know, this is an NFC West leading team. They are four and three right now. They have played good football. Do you feel like this is sustainable and they are contenders right now? And do you think they're contenders to not only make the playoffs, but win the AFC West and get a top four seed? If you would have asked me two weeks ago, I would have said probably not. Before the season, I thought this team's ceiling was seven, maybe eight wins of the most. I'm feeling a little more bullish on this football team right now for two reasons. One is the player I've already mentioned. Geno Smith just keeps playing at a high level. This this has not been a fluke. He is going out and he is wheeling and dealing. He's running around. He's making smart decisions. The whole playbook is opened up. He's using his tight ends consistently. So that's the other thing with Metcalf being out. He's just going to keep going to his tight ends. They've got three very good ones. And the second reason is the rookie class. Ken Walker the third looks like a superstar already. They've got two rookie tackles that have proven they're already quality starters in the NFL. They're just going to keep getting better. Those two guys have exceeded all expectations, particularly Abe Lucas at right tackle. Boy, Mafe is starting a defensive end and is playing really well. He's a great run defender, which nobody thought that he was coming into the NFL. He's really been a nice addition to their team. Tariq Woolen's got four interceptions, almost had his fifth one today. So he's playing at a really high level. Maybe an all-pro corner as a rookie. He's been that good. So it's the youth movement way ahead of schedule. And those guys are just going to keep improving, coupled with Geno Smith's play, the offense lighting up scoreboards. It looks like a legitimate contender in an NFC that's really down. They're a team you don't want to play moving forward. Yeah, I think that with, you know, we haven't seen necessarily a ton of great football this year. And I think the NFL in particular, you know, outside of the top couple teams is wide open. I think Seattle could definitely make a run and the clear winners from the draft so far based off their rookie production. But if you want to go check out Corbin's work over at the Locked on Seahawks podcast, highly recommend you do so. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Corbin, I appreciate you for hopping on. Thanks so much. We'll see. We'll see with Seattle. I think that Geno Smith's resurgence has been incredible. Obviously, prayers to DK Metcalf. Hopefully, there's nothing serious there. But they're a really fun team to watch. And and I think that they can seriously, with the amount of, I'd say, almost bad football we've seen this year throughout the entire league outside of a few teams, I think Seattle could be a sleeper team to make a run this year if they continue playing the way that they're playing. But that's all I have for you here today on Locked on NFL. Thank you so much for tuning in. When we get back here tomorrow, we'll be diving into more NFL content with your Tuesday host. So be sure to stay tuned for that, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.